In this example, we're going to look at the response of a system to a periodic input. So we're going to find out what the output of the system is, given some signal input to the system. We've done this type of problem before. The main difference in this example is we'll be doing the analysis using frequency domain concepts that we've been working on. So the input to the system is this periodic pulse train signal right here. So this is the signal x of t. So it consists of what I call an infinite pulse train, pulses spaced at regular intervals t naught. The width of these pulses is denoted by the variable tau. In this particular example, we're letting tau equal t naught over 2. The amplitude of these pulses is equal to 1. Some more specifics about this pulse train, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the fundamental frequency of the pulse train is 20 kilohertz. So based on that fundamental frequency, we can compute what T0 is. T0 is always 1 over F0. So T0, the period of this periodic signal, is 1 over 20 E3, because 20 kilohertz is 20 E3 hertz. So that is how often a pulse comes through. We can also compute the radial fundamental frequency if we want as well. Now that we know T0, we can compute the fundamental frequency in radians is 2 pi over T0. Or we could also just take that number and multiply by um, 2 pi f, since omega is always equal to 2 pi f. We'll use this here in just a little bit when we do our Fourier series representation. We usually do that in the omega domain, so we'll need omega naught. Also note, based on how we parameterized x of t by letting tau equal t naught over 2, this is what we call a half-duty waveform, meaning that it is on for half the time, and then it is off for half the time, and then it is on. So half the time this pulse train is on, half the time it's off, so it's half duty. Duty re referring to what we call the duty cycle, the percentage of time a signal is on. So this is the signal x of t we're going to deal with in this problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass this signal through what we call an ideal low-pass filter. So for now, we can think of that ideal low-pass filter, LPF, as this box, this linear system that's going to act on x of t, resulting in the output signal y of t. So I'm going to tell you some things about this low-pass filter. This low-pass filter we're actually going to characterize in the frequency domain. So I'm going to give you some properties and parameters of it, and we'll discuss what these mean. The first parameter is fc. This is what's called the cutoff frequency of the low-pass filter. And for this particular problem, we've set fc equal to 101 kilohertz. So that is what we call the cutoff frequency. And then the other property of this low-pass filter is its gain, which is equal to 10. So what do these numbers mean? So what these numbers mean, these are basically frequency domain characterizations of this linear system. What it means is that in the frequency domain, any signals between minus fc and fc come through the system, and they actually get multiplied by a gain of 10. So if I was to put in a cosine at, I don't know, say 5 kilohertz into this system, that exact cosine would come out, but its amplitude will have been multiplied by a factor of 10. If I was to put in a cosine at a frequency outside the cutoff frequency, say maybe I put in something with a frequency of 150 kilohertz, well, 150 kilohertz is up here, which means that this ideal low-pass filter completely rejects that signal. So if I put in cosine of 150 kilohertz, what comes out due to that term is nothing. It gets multiplied by zero. So this is a way to describe in the frequency domain how this system behaves. All right, so that's the problem setup. We now know what the signal is. We know what our system is. Let's answer some questions about the output. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find an equation for y of t, a time domain signal representation of the output. So if you remember, when dealing with periodic signals, we can always write a periodic signal in its exponential Fourier series representation, which I've done right here. So we can write x of t equals this infinite sum. And actually, we've previously analyzed this type of signal. So previously in the class, we analyzed a very generic pulse train and we actually computed the Fourier series coefficients for that pulse train, and this is the equation that we derived previously. We can compute the dNs via this equation right here. So we don't need to do this work from scratch in this problem. We can just use a result that we've computed previously. So let's think about what we have for this particular problem based on the parameters we see in this equation for dN. So first of all, we know the amplitude of our pulse train is 1, so that's one thing that we know. 
Another thing that we know about this problem is that tau is equal to t naught over 2. t naught, if you recall, controlled the offset with respect to the time origin. For this particular problem, there is no offset. That first pulse is centered up right at the time origin, so there is no offset, so t naught is equal to 0. Also, we know that omega naught times tau, we can compute what that is. Omega naught is always 2 pi over t naught, and in this problem, tau is equal to t naught over 2. So if we do that multiplication, we know that the product omega naught tau is equal to pi. So taking all these specific things for our problem into account, we can actually rewrite the exponential Fourier series coefficients as this simpler equation for this particular problem. All right, so let's think about what's going to happen in this representation for x of t. x of t consists of this infinite sum of complex exponentials at multiples of the fundamental frequency. So the first term is equal to 20 kilohertz. That's the fundamental frequency. The next term is equal to 40 kilohertz. That's n equals 1. The fifth term is equal to 100 kilohertz. And then finally, I get to the sixth harmonic, which would be 120. 6 times 20 is 120. And this is the first term that exceeds the cutoff frequency of my low-pass filter. So it's this term, the sixth term in this summation, that is going to be completely rejected. All the previous terms will be multiplied by 10. So taking that into account, we can actually just close form now, write down an expression for y of t. y of t is also going to be this representation, but we know that all the terms above 5 and below minus 5 get completely rejected, and all the terms in the summation from minus 5 to 5 get multiplied by 10. So if we wanted to, we could actually just write out this sum. It's going to have a total of 11 terms now. Here's what this sum is. We know what omega naught is. We know what these d's are based on this equation. So this right here is an equation for y of t. It's a time domain equation for y of t. It's kind of an ugly equation, but it is nonetheless an equation. We've used a frequency domain representation of our input signal. We've used what we know about our system and how it manipulates frequencies to be able to write out a closed form time domain equation for y of t. All right, let's do one more thing. Let's compute the power of the output signal y. So in general, the power of a signal can be written as the sum of the magnitude squared of its exponential Fourier series coefficients. So in general, if we knew what the coefficients for y of t were, it would be this. And kind of written here, this would be the dn's for y of t. Well, we, we know how to do this. We know how to write our dn's for y of t in terms of the dn's for x of t, right? We just figured out that it really just consists of these 11 terms, and the coefficients for y are 10 times the coefficients for x. So these were our original dn's for x. Getting multiplied by 10 turns them into the coefficients for y. So what that looked like was this. We can factor out the 10 squared. That's 100. And this is really a sum of 100 times the magnitude squared of dn's, where these dn's are the dn's of x of t. Because that's how they got manipulated when going through the system. So let's go ahead and write out what that looks like. So it's not too bad. It only consists of 11 terms. So I can just write out each one of those terms. If you'll notice, there's some nice symmetry in the d's. d of minus 5 equals d of 5 d of minus 4 equals d of 4, d of 3 equals d of minus 3, etc. So instead of adding up um, 10 terms, I can add up 5 terms and then multiply by 2. So that's what I've done right here. I've just exploited some of that symmetry. And then finally, we can actually go plug in and figure out what d1, d2, and d3 are. So d1 is sinc squared. I'm sorry, d1 squared is sinc squared of pi over 2. d1 is actually equal to sinc of pi over 2. D2 is sinc of pi, so then we square it. D3 is sinc of 3 pi over 2. Sinc of 4 pi over 2, which is 2 pi. And then sinc of 5 pi over 2. And then add on D0 is equal to 1. And now we can go ahead and plug into our calculator what we get. Remember, sinc of x is sine x over x. So sine of pi over 2 is actually equal to 1. And then divide by pi over 2, that kind of flips it to 2 over pi. Sine of pi is equal to 0, so we end up with a 0 squared for this term. Same thing happens here. 
sine of 3 pi over 2 is 1. 3 pi over 2 on the denominator flips it to be 2 over 3 pi. Sine of 2 pi is 0. And then finally that term. And if we plug all this into our calculator, this isn't too bad. We can add things up, multiply things out, and we get this as our final answer. So the final answer here actually is not so important. It's more the concept of how do we compute power from the exponential Fourier series representation. And for this particular problem, since we've worked out um, in the part A what that Fourier series representation was, it only consisted of 11 terms, and each term got modified by multiplying by 10, we can actually do this computation pretty easily.